I'm going to ask that you join with me as I read together, as I read out of Luke chapter 4, verses 31 to 37. And here we come and we find, and he, Jesus, came down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath. And they were amazed at his teaching, for his message was with authority. In the synagogue there was a man possessed by the spirit of an unclean demon, and he cried out with a loud voice, Let us alone! What business have we with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him down in the midst of the people, he came out of him without doing him any harm. And amazement came upon them all. And they began talking with one another, saying, What is this message? For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. And the report about him was spreading into every locality in the surrounding district. I know who you are. This I take as the title of my message today. I know who you are, and I want to ask the question, do we know who Jesus is? It was a demon that was speaking out of the soul of that man so long ago there in the synagogue of Capernaum. And one of the things that he says is, I know who you are. Now, striking that the demon who was unredeemable, there is no redemption, there is no salvation, there is no way back for fallen angels, which is exactly what demons are, there is no plan of God to bring them back to himself. But man, who has also fallen into sin, God has made a way. There is Jesus Christ, our Savior, who is our Redeemer. He is the answer to the question, is there a way back? Where can I find the way back? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the way, Jesus said, and there is no salvation except through him. So here we have this dilemma that a fallen angel, a demon, is saying, I know who you are. There was clarity to what this demon was saying. There was absolutely no doubt in his mind that Jesus was the Son of God. However, we who are fallen in sin, but redeemable because of the blood of Jesus Christ shed upon Calvary's cross, we do not have that same clarity, unfortunately, that that demon had and other demons when they were driven out by Jesus. There is not for us most often regrettably I say, that same clarity, and I want to examine this with you today. Luke chapter 4 is a striking chapter. First of all, there is the temptation of Jesus, which is recorded in the other Gospels as well, how that Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit having come down upon him at his baptism there in the Jordan, having descended as a dove upon him, and that was the picture of the anointing of Jesus. But at the outset of Luke chapter 4, we read that Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness. And after 40 days of temptation, we are given a glimpse of three particular temptations. I don't think that these were the only ones. Satan was leaning hard upon Jesus throughout those entire time. 
of 40 days, but here particularly are three that are held forth for us to learn from. Then, in verse 14 of chapter 4, Jesus returns from Galilee, and it says, in the power of the Spirit. So, Jesus, full of the Spirit, led by the Spirit, coming in the power of the Spirit, news spreads about him, the surrounding district, and he began teaching in their synagogues and was praised by all. First glimpse that Luke gives to us is going to Nazareth. Obviously, Nazareth, it, Nazareth is a very important point for Jesus. This is where he grew up for most of his life and lived there until he transferred his home, though he was wandering almost in constantly through the three years of ministry. His home base seemed to have moved to Capernaum, but Nazareth, the people knew him. They had seen him grow up. They knew Mary and Joseph. They knew the carpenter's shop. They knew Jesus' brothers and sisters, those who would come after Jesus. The family was known. Jesus, he comes, verse 16, and it says, as was his custom, he entered the synagogue. He was no stranger to Nazareth and especially to the synagogue. He had worshipped there many times, hearing the ancient scriptures read and joining together with others to give attention and to join in prayer. But on this Sabbath, he enters the synagogue and stood up to read. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. And he opened the book and found the place where it is written. Where is that place that it is written? Go to Isaiah chapter 61 and you will find exactly what Jesus read from that day. Isaiah chapter 61 verse 1. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Jesus was not simply reading something out of the Old Testament it was taking on a power. It was coming to life because if ever this portion of scripture was accurate, and I believe that it is accurate, each time a gospel minister stands to proclaim God's word that the spirit of the Lord is there and the anointing of God is there. But here most especially, the spirit of the Lord which had filled Jesus, which had led Jesus, and had brought him in power from his temptation experience, that spirit was there, it was present, and Jesus was to proclaim, he was to preach release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, and to announce, to proclaim and declare the favorable year of the Lord. And Jesus, then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant who had given it to him, and he sits down. It was customary that the exposition or the remarks that would follow would be given from a seated position. All the eyes of the synagogue attenders that day were riveted on Jesus as to what he would say next and he began to say to them today th right now today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing and all were speaking well of him and wondering at the gracious words which were falling from his lips 
And they were saying, is this not Joseph's son? We didn't remember Joseph as being particularly eloquent. And we know that he was gifted in working with wood, but where in the world did this one get these gracious words? And Jesus, he speaks to them. He speaks to them in comparison. They are going to say, look, the things that you did over there at Capernaum, why don't you do them here in your hometown? And Jesus points out to them that God does not work as a cookie cutter. There are ways that he works and there are reasons that he chooses to do what he divinely appoints to be done in each situation. And we can't box God in. All the people in the synagogue, all of a sudden those gracious words that Jesus had spoken, they are forgotten about and all of a sudden they are filled with rage and they grab a hold of this man who they have known for two or three decades and they're leading him to the brow of the hill on which the city was built in order to throw him over and to get rid of him. Interesting how the flip takes place here even as it did three years later when Jesus would go to Jerusalem and first of all they would welcome him gladly and then they would cry out crucify, crucify, crucify him. Now Jesus having slipped through their grasp and passing through the midst he goes on his way and he goes east to Capernaum and this is the passage which I just read to you that once again he was teaching them on the Sabbath and the people amazed at his teaching because it was with authority. It was not simply with eloquence. It wasn't simply that there was a demeanor to him which was unlike the others, that he had the best stories, the best illustrations, the best opening, the best closing, that there was drama in his voice, but they sensed that there was a sure authority that was taking place here. Matthew, as he would take pen in hand to write, he would speak, and his punchline is when Jesus at the very end would say, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore, Make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And lo, I am with you always. Amen. Authority. Jesus, he was given all authority. And here, the people, they sensed that authority in his voice, in his, mo in his motions, in his, his movements. In all that he did, they sensed that authority just emanated from him. It, it, it oozed from him. And they were amazed at his teaching. Now, in that synagogue that day, there were those who were there to truly worship the Lord, but there was also a man who had an unclean spirit and this unclean spirit interrupts the synagogue meeting. And the, the, the loud voice that cries out, let us alone, verse 34. What business do we have with each other? Jesus of Nazareth, have you come to destroy us? Let me stop there for just a moment. The unclean spirit, he recognized the power that Jesus had, first of all. But there is a speaking in the plural. Now, we hear that at another time, Jesus confronts a demon and he says, what is your name? And he says, we are legion for we are many. Here, it seems there was just one demon 
But the demon, he speaks on all of those who were not right with God. Have you come to destroy us? Have you come to mete out judgment before the appointed time? That one man had an unclean spirit, but in the hearts of others there were those who were not right with God. And whether you have an unclean spirit or whether you're just, as it were, a run-of-the-mill, routine, ordinary, very common sinner, you are both apart from God and you are lacking the salvation that we desperately need that comes only in Jesus Christ. Have you come to destroy us? We don't have anything to do with one another. We speak a different language. We value differently. Our priorities are completely different. We come to synagogue once a week. We sort of tip our hats at God and say, yes, you keep your side of the fence and we'll keep our side and all will be well. What do we have to do with each other? We don't deal in the same coinage. We don't use the same currency. There is no interaction between us at the deepest, most heartfelt level. What do we have to do with one another? Let us go on our way and conduct our business, conduct our worship, conduct our lives as we want. Please leave us alone. It was very much like those people who came out finding that man who previously had the legion of demons. Here he is, dressed in his right mind, no longer the wild man that he had been. And the people say to Jesus, please, please, go away, go away. We, we know how to deal with a crazy wild man, but the power that you obviously control and that you exercise. We don't know what to do with that. Please, please go away. What do we have to do with one another? This is what the demon said. Let us alone. What business do we have with each other? Have you come to destroy us? And then the demon says, I know. I know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. And that demon was right on the mark that day. Indeed, Jesus was the Holy One of God. At other points through Luke, we also find this very same theme that takes place. And it, it, it is as though Luke delights to return to this. For instance, in Luke chapter 8, verse 25, Jesus has just stilled the storm when the disciples had come to him and said, Master, we are perishing. Jesus gets up and rebukes the wind of the surging, surging waves. They stop and become calm. And Jesus asks them, where is your faith? The disciples are fearful and amazed, saying to one another, who is this? That he commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. Later on, in Luke chapter 9, this parallels Matthew chapter 16. Luke chapter 9 and verses 18 to 21 Jesus is with his disciples by Caesarea Philippi. Jesus asks his disciples, who do the people say that I am? And there are a few responses that are given. John the Baptist, others say Elijah, but others that one of the prophets of old has risen again. Jesus then narrows it down and he says, but who do you say that I am? And Peter, he exclaims, the Christ of God, the anointed one, the long-awaited Messiah that we have been looking for for centuries and even millennia. The Christ of God. And Jesus says to him and to them that they were not to tell anyone. 
Later on in that same chapter 9 of Luke, there would be the transfiguration of Jesus and there would be the Father who would say in Luke chapter 9, this is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. This is God's chosen one. This is the one that the Father delights in and loves. The demons knew. The disciples with difficulty would grow to know and others round about Jesus would grasp a hold as well. But it was with difficulty that they came. It is interesting that in chapter 4, verse 18, we have Jesus plainly declaring, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and he is saying, I am the anointed one. That particular one that has been looked for, and then just a short time later, Jesus says to this demon, now you shut up. You be quiet. I don't want to hear anything from you. Is it not this, that Jesus, he wanted faith to come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Some years ago, and even currently, there is a practice among preachers to begin a message with a movie clip or with a, a movie line. I've done that some years back, but I became very uncomfortable with that. How is it that we go to the world in order to declare spiritual truth? And I have not done that for a very long time. I think that here is the exact same thing that Jesus is doing. He is taking his listeners to the word of God. He is taking them into the scriptures in order that they might see it declare and preach who Jesus is. And when the demon strikes up and starts yelling and screaming and crying out in the midst of the meeting, he says, now you shut up. You have no business speaking. Yes, you know who I am, but these are not going to come about by your help, but they are going to come to real, genuine, solid faith based upon the scriptures based upon the very word of God. I think also into Luke chapter 16, where Jesus is speaking of the rich man and Lazarus, how that the rich man lived so well and Lazarus was such a poor beggar. Interesting that the rich man was anonymous. The poor man is given the dignity of a name. But both of them die. The rich man goes to Hades. Lazarus is taken into Abram's bosom, into paradise. The rich man looks up and sees Lazarus a long way away, and he says, can you not come and just wet my tongue, for I am in torment in this place. And Abraham says, no, not possible. There's this big gulf that's placed between the two of us. There's no crossing from the one to the other, either direction. And then he says, would you please send Lazarus back? For I have five brothers. I want them to be warned that they do not come to this place of torment. And the word is, let them hear. Moses and the prophets. But the rich man, the former rich man, he cries out, No, Father Abraham, but if someone rises from the dead, they will repent. And the word is, if they do not hear the scriptures, if they do not hear Moses, if they do not hear the preaching of the prophets, there is no hope for them that they would be converted. So here Jesus, as he's in the synagogue that day in Capernaum, he speaks and he proclaims who he truly is, that the Spirit of the Lord has come upon him. But when the unclean spirit cries out, he says, you be quiet. 
we shall have none of your advertising. And when the demon had thrown him down in the midst of the people, he came out of him without doing him any harm. And the people were amazed. What is this message for with authority and power? He commands the unclean spirits and they come out and the word spreads. Where is your faith based and upon what is it built? Is it built upon drama? Is it built upon some amazing episode or some experience? Or is it built upon the word of God? Jesus knew that experience would come and go. He knew that there would be great drama at times, but he wanted people to hear the word of God and so at the outset of his ministry, at this vital point, he goes to the synagogue, takes the scroll of the mighty prophet Isaiah, and reads out from Isaiah. He could have declared it himself and said, look, this is what I have come to do. But Jesus, he wanted to honor and he wanted to exalt the Old Testament word of God, the scriptures that we in like manner might do the same, that we might hold up the word of God and realize how precious it is. And that when other things might clamor for attention, when other things cry out with a loud voice, that we might continue to delight ourselves in the word of God which has power. The Apostle Paul said, faith, it comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Be grounded in the word and let your faith grow and grow as you delight in what God has given us in his blessed word. Lord, we give you thanks and praise for your word and may we continue to delight in it and to rejoice in all of your goodness evermore, we ask in Jesus' name, amen.